thank you so much for coming back this evening and remaining with us. We had such a wonderful, wonderful meal, and thank you so much to everybody who cooked. And I even know that there's a man, at least one man, that cooks some of the food. So your son is certainly men can cook. We're glad that you're here. Uh, I am uh, going to lead us in a word of prayer, which you might name uh, Bob Daly. And uh, this man has requested that we would pray for him, uh, especially to be forgiven. Uh, he has uh, done some things. I'm not privy to everything that he's done, but he recognizes that he's, uh, he needs to repent of those things and confess those things. He wants us to pray for him. He's in a nursing home. He's uh, confined there, but he does watch services on online and things and does what he can there. I don't know the full history. I just know that and I just spoke to one of the elders here uh, about his praying for him. So that's what we do. Let's go to God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you love us and that you know us so well. And our Father, we are so thankful too that you give us so many opportunities and the information so that we know that we should always come back to you. We pray at this time for Bob Daly. We pray for him because of the things he has committed in the past. And now he is confined to a nursing home, but he is very sorry for the things that he has done and for anything he may have done recently that is wrong. He's also uh, very ashamed of those things. He has requested that his brothers and sisters would pray for him. And we are so happy to do that. We pray, our Father, you would forgive him. Help him to live the life that he knows he needs to live. And we pray that if there's others that have been harmed because of his actions, that he goes to them and also tells them of his repentance as well. My Father, we thank you for loving us in such a great way. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Thank you, Reed, for leading that prayer. I'm very thankful for that. I think this is just a good example that. Uh, Although we have an invitation to him at, uh, at the end of each lesson, when we get together like this to, to allow time for people to come forward and confess sin or to obey the gospel, there's not even one time for that. We can do that any time. We've got four good elders who do good ministry and various other people. If you ever have a need, uh, make, make a phone call. Don't, don't wait for some specific time. I'm not going to go through the whole prayer list again. It seems like it's a few minutes ago that we finished with it, but I will give you just an update. Uh, we did mention that Andrew McCauley was particularly having some bad days, so please keep her in your prayers. Uh, Marie Eaton was showing some improvement, but she's still at Memorial, so continue to pray for her. And we did have an updated address for her. If you did not have that, uh, it's on the bookshelf on the right side as you're going out, and the address lives there. We've got her new address on it. Bed is waiting for his test results. <clears throat> his doctor told me he had this past week. He's had his prayers as well. We also noted that Linda Huber uh, was out sick this morning. So he just heard his prayer. I can mark that fellowship well off until next month because we just had a great fellowship meal. Thanks for everyone who participated in that and brought all the good food. Next Saturday, April 6th, be the men's breakfast at 8 a.m. Uh, you can sign up to get on the bulletin board for that, and our security team will meet at that breakfast time. And also on April 6th, make sure if you haven't talked to Don already and let him know that you want help, uh, tell him that you want help because uh, Sister, Nancy, Sister Nancy Nation uh, is going to be moving on Saturday, April 6th, and we need to several guys there to help load all the stuff up. going on. Uh, New Christian Bible class starts on April 7th, 10 a.m. downstairs. Youth led worship is on Sunday, April 7th. We appreciate our young men leading that evening to worship. We had noticed they, they don't they don't combine their help for that one uh, Sunday a month either. They help every Sunday. Group one will be signing compassion cards after that evening worship on Sunday the 7th. Uh, during the middle of the day there on the 7th will be the bridal shower for Olivia and Joey. Here at 2.30, they're registered at Amazon, so make sure you support them in that as well. We also noted this morning uh, an announcement about their wedding 
it's posted on the back of the phone number. You need to call that to RSVP if you're going to be with some great way. That helps them plan for how many people are going to be there. So make sure you go back there and get that phone number and RSVP for that wedding that you're going to be there. You need that done for that as soon as possible, but uh, today is the Tent singing in River Bend, Sunday, April 14th. And our CPR classes. Uh, recertification class will be on April 20th. That will be here at the building at 9 to 12. You need to sign up for that. The sign up sheet on the bulletin board to the right is deleted. Um, you can also talk to Sister Diane if you have any questions about that. If you haven't been certified, we would like to participate on that uh, team. And you can talk to Diane and she'll get together an initial certification class. With that. That's all the announcements I have at this time. The proper time, our scripture reading will come from Psalm 139. Psalm 139, that'll be read by Caleb Jackson. Our opening prayer will be led by Frank Chantel, and our closing prayer by Z. Perry. We'll begin our worship song. We will glorify the King. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify. God. 
songs of praise to your name, and we may listen to your word taught in private things to our lives. Pray that you will bless each, each act of worship that we do in your honor. Bless and read if you gave a lesson and help us to listen to private things to our lives before Christ. Bless us in the service to you every day of our life, Heavenly Father. Help us always to be the Christian you have us to be, the servant you, you want us to be. Young Father, all that we do is help us to encourage others to serve you. Help us to do those things that, that would lead others to you and teach others your word. If we have opportunity to teach a private Bible study, we pray that we may take advantage of this and teach your word. All that we do in your name is pray that we'll give you the glory. Bless each one here today. Bless Young Father. Pray that you will bless David in his struggle and his health and bless him. Help him to encourage us and bless him. That's all we do in your name to give us the Christ name. Yes.
Good evening, church family. It's so great to be here with you tonight. I couldn't think of a better place in all the world to be than right here with the good folks at the Lafayette Church of Christ. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Second Peter chapter 3, and we are going to try to pick up where we left off a few weeks ago. Remember, if you will, that this chapter is all about the second coming of Christ. And we are looking at this chapter in three different sections. The last time we were together, we looked at the dependability of the second coming. In tonight's study, we're going to look at the kind of people we should be in view of the second coming. And we should be people who live a life of devotion. What should we, as Christians, be devoted to? This entire chapter is one complete paragraph. Many times, when you are looking at a chapter in the Bible, there will be certain words that serve as grammatical bridges that connect thoughts, but they also help to divide the text and show you when the author is making a different point. One of those words is the word therefore, and in verses 11 through 18, the word therefore appears three times. It's found in verse 11. If you're following along with your Bible and not the PowerPoint, do you see it? Now I have the new King James on the PowerPoint. In the King James Version, it's going to be the phrase seen there. And if you will drop down to verse 14, you're going to see this word again. In the King James, it's going to be the word wherefore. And then finally, you see this word in verse 17. So, that's the way we are going to divide this last section in this chapter. As you and I await the second coming of Christ in verses 11 through 13, we're going to see that we must be devoted to a life of proper living. In verses 14 through 16, we must be devoted to a life of purity. And then in verses 17 through 18, we must be devoted to a life of spiritual growth. Now, because your bellies are full, and I don't want you to develop flesh from falling asleep, or fall out of the view into the floor. I'm just going to cover the first point, and that is verses 11 through 13. 
and Lord willing, we will cover the rest of the chapter next week. Let's begin by reading verses 11 through 13. Peter writes, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Notice if you will in verse 13 that we have our first use of the word therefore, and watch how it connects the thought in verses 11 through 13 to the previous verses. Peter said, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what is Peter referring to when he makes that statement? It is a direct reference to the destruction of the world, which Peter was discussing in verse 10. And look at the next statement. Because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. That also is a reference to verse 10. So the word therefore does two things. It lets us know that Peter has not changed his subject of discussion. And remember that this whole chapter is about the second coming of Christ. The second thing that the word therefore does is that it lets us know that Peter is about to make another point about the same subject. So what is Peter's point? Since this world is going to be destroyed, and there is no hope in this world. Our focus should not be on this world, but on the kind of people we should be when Jesus returns. And what kind of people should we be? We should be people who practice proper living. And what does proper living look like? It is a life of holy conduct and godliness. To begin with, it is a life of holy conduct. What is the meaning of the word holy? The word holy refers to someone who is sacred. And the word sacred refers to someone who is dedicated or devoted to the worship and service of God. Someone who is physically pure and morally blameless. Now look at how these two definitions go together. If you are going to be dedicated to the worship and service of God. You must be pure and morally blameless. And look at this last definition. One who is separate from the common condition. Now, what is man's common condition? It's sin, isn't it? Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. One who is holy or sacred is one who has separated himself from sin. Now, that doesn't mean that he never sins, but it does mean that we are no longer in the sin business. He doesn't live a life of sin. But notice that the word holy also refers to one who is consecrated, and this word means to separate or to show oneself to be sacred. And finally, the word holy refers to a most holy one or a saint. Now, I want you to let that definition sink in, because the Bible teaches us that if we are going to be prepared for the second coming of Christ, we must be holy. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Do you remember the definition of the word holy? It's one who is sacred. It's one is consecrated. It's a most holy one, a saint. And we are to be holy because we serve the holy God. But someone may say, But I can't be holy, it's just an impossibility. 
brethren, if it was impossible, why then would God command you? Listen to First John chapter 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, according to this passage. How do we show God that we love him? It's by keeping his commandments. And John said that God's commandments are not burdensome. In other words, they are not beyond our ability to keep. So, brethren, we can be holy. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. For to peace without people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Notice that the Hebrew writer said that we are to pursue holiness, and the word pursue means to chase after something with the intent of catching it. Listen to Second Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Did you hear what Paul said? Not only are we to be holy, but we are to perfect holiness. And the word perfecting means to accomplish or to perform or complete. And how do we perfect holiness? We perfect holiness by cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. In other words, we cleanse ourselves of sin. And the motivation for cleansing ourselves from sin is the fear of God or reverence. In fact, godly fear causes us to depart from evil. Look at Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 6. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. So, if we are going to be prepared for the second coming, we must practice holiness. Now, if we are going to prepare for the second coming, we must also practice godliness. What is godliness? This word is defined as one who is very religious and shows reverence for God. Now, look at what I believe is the Bible definition of godliness. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And without controversy great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Let me ask you a question. What is verse 16 about? Is this not a story of the life of Christ? So godliness is having reverence towards God and his Son. And we serve the God who has given us everything we need to practice godliness. Look at Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who you called us by glory and virtue. Did you hear what Peter said? God has given us everything that we to know about godliness, and that is found in no other place but the Bible. And just as we are to pursue holiness, we are to pursue godliness. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. But you, O man of God, Flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. And when you and I pursue godliness, we will be blessed. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Did you hear that? When we practice godliness, it blesses us in this life, and most importantly, it blesses us in the life to come. Now, let's go back to our text. And as a result of living a prepared life, Peter presents us with two blessings. 
First, we can look forward to the second coming. Look at what Peter said, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. The word looking means to look with anticipation and expectation. And the word hastening means to be eager for the arrival of something. Isn't that a beautiful thought? If we are holy and bleak, we don't have to fear that great day. We can look forward to it and hope that they come soon. Now, for those who are not prepared, it's going to be just awful. They're going to experience regret like they've never known. And there won't be anything they can do about it. But look at the second blessing. Peter said we can look for new heavens and a new earth. What is this new heavens and new earth? This phrase appears four times in the Bible. It's found here in 2 Peter. It's also found in Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 17. Then it's found in Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 22. But what is this new heavens and new earth? Now, many believe that God is going to recreate this earth for the righteous to live on. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Did you hear that? We are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and we'll always be with the Lord. But where will we go? Look with me at John chapter 14 and verses 1 through 3. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. There are several things about this passage that I would like for you to notice with me. The first phase one wants you to notice is my father's house. Obviously, we understand that the word house is not talking about a physical structure. It's talking about the dwelling place of God. And where does God dwell? He dwells in heaven. Look at Psalm chapter 11 and verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. And the word temple means dwelling place. So where is the dwelling place of God? Let's read on. His throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of man. Now let's go back to our text. And from the previous scripture we learned that God's house or dwelling place is in heaven. And in heaven there are many mansions. And the word mansions means dwelling places. Notice if you will that these dwelling places were already in existence when Jesus spoke these words. And Jesus told his disciples that he was going to prepare a place for them. And the word prepare means to make ready. Now notice carefully verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Brethren, that is a direct reference to the second coming of Christ. So, where is Christ right now? Listen to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Now, we have already established the fact that the Father is in heaven. So what does this verse teach? 
It teaches that Christ also is in heaven and he is sitting at the right hand of God. So let's put all of this together. Jesus told his disciples that in heaven there are many dwelling places and that he was going to heaven to prepare those places. And once those places are made ready, then he's going to come back and take his disciples to heaven with him. Brothers and sisters, if there has ever been a scripture that destroys the idea of this earth being recreated, this is the scripture. In addition to that passage, consider also Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look also at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirit of just men made perfect. Brethren, these two scriptures undeniably teach that the future home of the church is in heaven. With those thoughts in mind, let's go to the last place in the Bible where we find the phrase, new heavens and new earth. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21 in verses 1 through 2. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Notice if you will are a phrase, new heavens and new earth. And notice also the phrase, the holy city in New Jerusalem. What is the holy city in New Jerusalem? Drop down to verses 9 and 10. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit of to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Notice that the great city, the holy Jerusalem, is identified as the bride, the lamb's wife. Now who is the lamb? Well, I believe that you already know who the lamb is, but let's prove our answer. Look at John chapter 1 and verses 35 and 36. Again, the next day, John stood up for two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Now we know who the Lamb is, but who is his bride? Listen to Romans chapter 7 and verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. As Paul wrote to the church at Rome, he told them that they were married to the one who had been raised from the dead. Now, who is that a reference to? That is a reference to none other than Jesus Christ. So, Paul was telling the church at Rome that they were married to Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. As Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he told them that he had betrothed them to one husband, and that one husband is identified as Christ. But what does the word betroth mean? It means to promise for marriage or to unite in marriage. So, just as the church at Rome was married to Christ, the church at Corinth likewise was married to Christ. So, what's the conclusion? The church, without a doubt, is the Lamb's wife. 
Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 21. We have discovered that, that the holy city, New Jerusalem, is the church. And in this chapter of the Bible, the Apostle John is portraying the church in her future glorified state in heaven. So what is the new heaven and new earth? Look at the next part of that verse with me. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. When you think about the earth, it is our dwelling place for now, is it not? Now, if our present dwelling place will be destroyed when Christ returns, we'll need a new dwelling place, won't we? And we have already seen that our future dwelling place is going to be heaven. So, I'm going to suggest that the new heaven and new earth is a metaphor for the future dwelling place of God's people, which is heaven. And look at how Peter continues to describe our home in heaven. It's a place where righteousness dwells. Now, what is righteousness? Righteousness is defined as the act of doing what agrees with God's standards. A Bible definition of this word can be found in Psalm chapter 119 and verse 172. My tongue shall speak of your word. For all your commandments are righteousness, and the Bible teaches us that we should practice righteousness in the lives that we live. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 13, the Bible teaches us that we are instruments of righteousness. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, the Bible teaches that we are to hunger and thirst after righteousness. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, the Bible teaches that we are to seek righteousness. And in Psalm chapter 106 and verse 3, the Bible teaches that we are to practice righteousness at, at all times. But be honest, brethren, it's not always easy to practice righteousness in a world filled with wickedness, is it? There are many times when we fail, don't we? And how does it make you feel when you fail? You feel horrible, don't you? I suppose that's one of the many reasons why I'm looking forward to heaven. Because in heaven, we will never fail ever again. Why? Because we will be in a place where nothing but righteousness dwells. It reminds me of Amos chapter 5 and verse 24. But let justice run down like water, and righteousness like a mighty stream. Can you just imagine what it will be like to be in a place where absolutely nothing but righteousness dwells? To be, be completely surrounded by righteousness? I just can't wrap my mind around that thought. But I sure do want to go there, don't you? We are going to stop right there and Lord willing, we will finish out the chapter next Sunday night as we prepare for the second coming of Christ. You may be here tonight and you are not prepared for the second coming of Christ. It may be because you are not a New Testament Christian. If that is the reason, why not become a Christian tonight? If you will believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, and be baptized for the remission of sins, you can become a Christian tonight. Or maybe you're here tonight, and you're already a Christian, but you know that your life is not right, and you know that you are not prepared for the second coming. Why don't you come home this afternoon and make things right with God? If you need to respond to the invitation, for any reason, why not come right now as we stand and sing?
Heavenly Father, so very thankful that we can this day of life. We thank you for this gathering and for the great things that have occurred here, for the relationships we have, for the fellowships that we also have, for the contacts that we've made. And we pray, our Father, for the Bible studies that are ongoing. We pray that these will be successful. We pray for the teachers and the students. And our Father, we thank you so much for your long suffering and for allowing time to exist and for the opportunities that come our way. And our Father, we have so many trials in this life, but we know that one day, we allow ourselves to be faithful to you, that we can live an eternal life with you. Our Father, we look forward to that. But help us as we remain here to be constantly vigilant and constantly active. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.